Yesterday was probably the most critical testing day that SpaceX has had since the launch of SN15. Indeed, some would argue that it was even a more important day, simply because two static fires were arranged on two different pieces of equipment, both the orbiter and the booster. Static fires are not easy to arrange, regardless of the number of engines that you're using, and yet they managed to carry out two very impressive and very successful static fires in the course of the same day. However, what does this mean for the orbital launch? How close are we at this point? Well, we're going to find all of that out, together with some rarely seen footage from a good friend of mine on South Padre Island in just a moment. Hello YouTube, I'm the Angry Astronaut and this is... First, a quick note about my video yesterday and something that I forgot to mention. You may recognize this particular animation because it comes from my intro, so you've probably seen it over and over again. This is the Japanese H3 from Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, and something that I mentioned in my previous video is its large fairing makes it attractive to a variety of different customers. What I didn't say is just how close Japan Japan is from having a manned space program because of this rocket. On February 26th of this year, Sierra Space made an announcement that they would be collaborating with the Kanamatsu Corporation and also the Oita Spaceport as a potential hub for Dream Chaser landings. And this means that Japan will become an important part of the Sierra Space Low Earth Orbit Infrastructure. But what was also mentioned to me at roughly the same time when I was interviewing Sierra Space in in Las Vegas was the fact that Dream Chaser is not a strictly proprietary piece of technology. That is to say, they are open to sharing it with allied organizations such as the European Space Agency and JAXA, and the H-3 rocket has a fairing that is perfectly sized for the Dream Chaser, meaning that Japan is just a few years away from having the capability of launching their own astronauts on their own rockets and landing them in Japan shortly thereafter. A much more plausible scenario for Japan to have its own manned space program than some of the other methods that I mentioned in that video. You haven't seen that video yet? Well, you are missing out because the Japanese are doing some very innovative stuff, both in public and private space flight. Okay, let's move on to the static fires. By the way, this footage is provided provided by Lab Padre and I also have additional footage provided by Mars Embassy, a really nice fellow who has a room just across from the launch pad on South Padre Island. No, his views are not quite as impressive as this stuff, but nevertheless, he gives some perspective just as if you were in one of those hotels on South Padre Island, which I find to be pretty interesting. I urge you to subscribe to both of these channels. But as you can see right here, Booster 7 did carry out a static fire yesterday. However, what kind of static fire? Well, it was only a single engine. And although this may seem disappointing to some of you, this is exactly what I hope that SpaceX would do. A very slow and methodical testing campaign utilizing one engine and perhaps two or three, perhaps the inner ring followed by the outer ring. It's extremely important for them to gain an understanding of what sort of impact one engine firing has on so many other engines that are surrounding it. This is a very closely clustered group of the most powerful chemical engines ever created. The fuel delivery system alone
alone for 33 engines is highly complicated and trying to have all of this work perfectly while all 33 engines are firing at the same time is an extreme challenge as far as rocket science and engineering are concerned. This is the pinnacle of challenging rocket science when it comes right down to it. Yes, Starship is simple in some ways, but when it comes to a 33 engine cluster, there's nothing simple about it. But slow and cautious does not mean unexciting because just a few hours later, SpaceX performed a second static fire on SN24, or S24, I believe it's called these days, and that was also highly successful. There were only two engines involved in this static fire, unconfirmed reports that these two engines were vacuum raptors, and doesn't really matter because they were aggressive enough to perform static fires on both of their vehicles, which are just a few hundred meters away from each other, incidentally, on the same day. This certainly wasn't an easy thing to do, not an extremely safe thing to do, but they did it, and I applaud SpaceX for pushing forward on both vehicles on the same day. It definitely demonstrates that they're serious about this program, and yet at the same time, it also shows that they are demonstrating the type of common sense that is going to be necessary to get these ships off the ground without creating some sort of disastrous anomaly that will trigger immediate lawsuits from the Sierra Club and other opponents of SpaceX in the region. So what's next? Well, in my opinion, it's time to analyze the data. They need to determine what sort of impact, if any, conducting these static fires had on nearby engines, the various subsystems, the structural integrity of both vehicles, and perhaps most importantly, all of the heat tiles on S24. That's going to be an extremely important factor to consider if they ever want to successfully re enter with this ship. Yes, this is going to be a slow and gradual process, perhaps a little bit tedious to some of us, but nevertheless, it's going to be very exciting indeed. One static fire after another, more engines every time they conduct a static fire, gradually moving up to a 33 engine static fire. After that, of course, then they're going to have to stack both vehicles on top of one another fully fueled, that's going to be tricky, and then conduct a 33 engine static fire. In my opinion, they'll probably conduct a more gradual campaign of static fires on the fully stacked vessel before they move up to a 33 engine static fire to see whether or not the structural integrity of the full vessel holds up the way they're predicting before they subject it to the power of full thrust. In my opinion, this is the safest way to proceed. Yes, it's going to take time, but at the same time, it's the best way to avoid a potential anomaly. As I've mentioned many times before, an anomaly with a fully stacked starship is going to be many, many times more devastating than what we saw with SN11, for example. And with all of the legal hawks at the Sierra Club and elsewhere waiting in the wings for SpaceX to make a serious mistake, this is the best way for them to proceed. And everything we saw yesterday suggests that this is how they are going to proceed. So what does that mean for an orbital launch? Well, Elon said one to 12 months. My instincts tell me that the first successful orbital launch will be in the spring of 2023. You heard it here first, guys. That's my prediction. We'll see whether or not I'm correct. In the meantime, smash that like like, hit that subscribe. Most importantly, hit that notification button. Please check out the description for ways to support my content in the future. And as always, stay angry about space.